Good morning, church family, and welcome to another beautiful Sunday. Thank you for joining us once again online. Uh, we had an interesting week. On Wednesday, we did uh, uh, fasting and kind of turned into the Bible, and I focused on a little bit of stuff about faith, and I, and I started looking back over my readings in faith, and one of my favorite Bible verses of all time, or at least one of those statements that comes from the Bible, is that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move and it will move i mean anybody that grew up doing star wars immediately thinks oh wow christian jedi ninja warrior skills would be absolutely fantastic to have and and then you'll read farther into the bible and it shows faith without deeds is dead and so we have to look at that even deeper that <laughs> guess what in me he, god may not have meant that you could make the mountain move but if you give it the effort you probably can and so we're focusing on right now possibly on moving. Now, I don't think that any of us are ready to move a mountain, but we have a new opportunity. Behind me, you will see this beautiful house in Kashmir, which will now be the center of operations for the Johnson family. There are some new, fam new members to our church. Wonderful people, Jeff and Catherine, are gonna be moving here on August 15th, and they need all the help they can get. They've got four wonderful daughters and uh, a new one who is incredibly cute. And this is where they're moving to because it fits their needs and it fits uh, what they need to have for their family right now. We're asking the church to, have, to step out in faith and uh, come and give us a hand moving them. <laughs> it might not be the complete total uh, Christian Jedi ninja warrior skills, but it can definitely be the Christian furniture moving skills. Weak mind, strong back, doesn't matter. We're glad to have you. We're going to meet at their house in East Wenatchee on August 15th uh, at 9 a.m. And we will not be uh, carrying all the stuff here. We've got a giant U-Haul. We're going to fill it up, bring it up here. Might have to make a couple of trips. But if you can make it, guys, we would love to have you participate. All right. Have yourselves a great week, guys. Trust in Jesus, and believe me, it's all going to come out great. See you next week. But wait, there's more. Guess what, church family? I have sent the announcement in through the uh, production manager, and also known as my wife. Uh, she has pointed out that I seem to have failed to forget to tell everybody where we're meeting. Evidently, East Wenatchee is a larger spot than uh, just driving to uh, Jeff and Catherine's house. 2560 Fancher Heights. Wait, what? Fancher Landing. 2560 Fancher Landing. That's in East Wenatchee, in case you missed it the first time. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the addendum. I am now closing it. And my wife is actually cackling in her bathrobe over there. And I'm going to turn this around and show the entire church just so they can see what's. Uh, maybe not. Bye, guys. <laughs> Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, and treasures of faith are never enough. But you came along, they put me back together.
stretches to the sky.
I'm Michael Scott, regional manager, and I'm not a little, I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. Hey church family, Goodrich's here. Just uh, wanted to pop on here and just share how the Lord has been working in our lives over the last little bit. Yeah. So go ahead. So I'd say um, we're really experiencing uh, just the fruits um, of what we've been working at and putting our time into, I'd say this last year, eight months to a year. Um, I, but I would say last summer, we probably hit all, all time low with our family, um, just with Ty and I's relationship. Then with, with my relationship with the kids, especially my son Jude, things weren't going real smooth. And uh, it's a lot of fighting, um, it's a lot of not getting along. I'm just kind of, kind of seeing some wedges driven in between some relationships and I wasn't handling things the best, especially with where I struggle. And uh, we just finally came to a spot where we were like, something has to change. Mm -hmm. And we've been, we were putting in some work and um, time of scripture and listening to podcasts and just trying to do some research on kind of a goal and a direction we needed to be heading um, so we weren't just going blind. And uh, we came across a couple really good books. Um, one was To Hell with the Hustle and the other one was The uh, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry that really helped us reevaluate just our rhythms and practices in our, our daily life and um, realize that uh, what we were filling up with and uh, seeking and spending our time with, with and being distracted with was just uh, kind of spinning our wheels and we weren't just getting in a good spot. And so we started um, just the spiritual disciplines, really working towards those um, to an end goal to spend time with the Lord, not just to check a box and not just to go through the motion and uh, have really just seen a turnaround in our family, um, just with how we how we operate, um, just how um, just, how we get yeah. along, how we just function, communicate. Yeah. I mean, those are things that we really prioritized mm -hmm. um, starting, yeah, last fall, last summer, um, and it's just been really cool to <laughs> see how the Lord has worked through those practices. So. Yeah. And I would say, I always think of this um, old Indian quote or story um, where this guy, I can't remember if I saw it off the movie or what, it's talking about two wolves and one was a bad wolf and one was a good wolf. And they're going to war, fighting, and he was said, well, which one wins? And he goes, well, it's the one you feed. Whoa. And I was, was thinking about what, what we were feeding in our life at the time and what our desires were and what we were being distracted by. And I was like, well, no wonder we're in the spot <laughs> we're in. And when we started um, changing the way we just did life and what we focused on and um, what we poured our time and energy in, um, now we're seeing the fruit of it. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's a no brainer, but sometimes we just, I don't know, we just, <laughs> kind of blind in the, in the moment and just don't see it when it's right in front of us. So. Yeah. Just had to really trust the Lord this year too. We made some big changes in our family where um, I'm no longer going to be teaching and um, 
going to be home with the kids from now on. So um, with that, we really wanted to, just a second, baby. Oh my God, duckies. Um, we really just want to focus on getting families back. I mean, we're obviously starting with ours, but yeah. just- And we're um, not doing this perfectly. No. I mean, we're just, there's so much yeah. room for improvement. But. Yeah, just want to get back though to, you know, God's design for families and marriage and what that looks like and so starting a vlog which is kind of scary but just putting ourselves I would say in a situation where our comfort level is um, <laughs> being challenged mm -hmm. um, it's not something that either of us are comfortable with so it's been good and I always just say like we can't grow unless we're putting ourselves in those challenging situations. So we're doing it for these guys because it matters and because that's what God wants for us. So, yeah, so that's how he has been working um, in our lives. We love you guys. We miss you so, so much and cannot wait to be back. Say bye Jude. Bye guys. <laughs>Gracias por apoyar al envío de los obreros de la Alianza de Estados Unidos a América Latina. Estos obreros nos han equipado para llevar el Evangelio hasta los confines de la tierra. La presencia de ellos marca la diferencia en cómo capacitamos a los candidatos hoy. Trabajar con ellos es unidad como cuerpo de Cristo. Gracias a su ayuda, la Iglesia Latinoamericana de la Alianza se está convirtiendo en una fuerza misionera para los no alcanzados. Hello, Alliance Family. Thank you for sending Alliance workers to the city of Ishinomaki which was devastated by the earthquake and tsunami nine years ago. We have been serving together for five years now. I've been so blessed to work with them. We desire to see the spiritual breakthrough and now several seekers are regularly coming to our house church. We are very excited. God is at work. Thank you so much for sending workers and for your prayers and support. Je voudrais vraiment vous remercier pour tout ce que vous êtes en train de faire, d'envoyer les missionnaires au niveau du Congo. J'ai été gagné au Seigneur par les missionnaires de la CEMA venus au Congo pour l'évangélisation. Je suis aujourd'hui serviteur au sein de cette communauté. Je suis pasteur en même temps enseignant à l'Institut biblique. J'assume aussi la responsabilité du directeur de programme au niveau de la radio chrétienne. Je voudrais vous dire de continuer à soutenir les équipes missionnaires ici et financièrement et même dans vos prières pour leur permettre de faire avancer l'œuvre à laquelle ils sont en train de faire au niveau du Congo. Que Dieu vous bénisse et merci de tout ce que vous êtes en train de faire. Good morning, church family. Thanks, Brad, for sharing these gorgeous photos from your recent trip to Stahican with us. It definitely got us talking about heading back up there ourselves. What an incredible place. Oh, and hey, I also want to thank all of you who jumped on the Faith Life post last week to get a lift chair for our precious Ruby Rice. The Valdez and Jester families took that on and Ruby got her brand new chair delivered to her house last Wednesday. That's one beautiful and happy looking lady. Thank you so much for being the hands and feet of Jesus to her. 
Okay, I've only been in the presence of a wild, uncaged lion once in my life, but I'll never forget it. In 2002, my parents and I spent a few days in Kruger National Park in South Africa, hoping to see the iconic African animals in their native environment. Our guide, Petro, was a third generation ranger, born and raised on the reserve. He explained the animals were used to seeing and being around open top safari trucks like the one we were in, and saw them as one large unit. They'd pretty much ignore us as long as we stayed inside, but if you broke the silhouette of the truck by stepping out, the wildlife might respond to you in a very individual way. Right? Petro was the guide. All the other guides asked about where certain animals might be, and he did not disappoint. Right about sunset, he spotted the male lion we're looking for. The cat was huge, old, and radiated power and confidence. He was lying down, and thankfully, he ignored us. Even so, I was really nervous when we kept rolling closer and closer to him until we were only about 20 yards away. He looked so incredibly strong, calm, and perfectly suited to his domain that I couldn't help but look at myself and, and see myself as slow and pink and juicy. Rather bored with our presence, he just laid there. And Petro explained that male lions bellow to signal their territory and ward off any other male lions who might have wandered into his territory. He started making this sound in his throat that mimicked a male lion, lion bellowing in the distance, and that got our lion to stand up on alert. Petro did it a few more times, and then our lion started responding in kind. A lion's bellow can be heard from five miles away, so when it's right next to you, you feel it in your whole body. And I don't know if I've ever felt so small. Then this lion started walking around the area, and a new respect formed in us as we watched this enormous predator go through bushes and brush and trees making no more noise than a house cat on carpet. He was so awesome to watch that we stayed there after sundown using a spotlight from the truck to see him until he finally disappeared into the dark. Maybe we should have noticed the spotlight getting dimmer, but when Petro tried to start the truck, it was clear the battery had been drained. He got on the radio to let people know where we were so they could come help us but it was late, and the radio was also powered by our dying battery. For real, I'm not making any of this up. You can ask my mom because she was there. Couldn't start the truck, couldn't use the light, couldn't radio for help. We were stuck in a 7,500 square mile game reserve in the dark with at least one huge lion nearby we couldn't see or hear. And Petro had just provoked the lion to be on alert to defend his territory. On the positive side, the truck was a manual transmission, so it could be started by getting it rolling and popping the clutch. Seeing as we were on a flat spot, our only option was to do that thing they told us never to do. Petro, my dad, and I got out of the truck and started pushing. I think we all looked over our shoulders the whole time to see if we were about to get pounced on while our wives prayed their hearts out. By the grace of God, we all managed to jump back in the truck as it gained enough speed to start up and get us out of there. The bugs in our camp tents that night didn't seem nearly as scary as they had the night before. Okay, I tell you that story because we're reading a well-known story in the Bible today. The story of Daniel and the lion's den. It's an incredible story. We often tell our young ones, and rightly so, but since not many of us have encountered wild lions, I want us to remember these were not bug-eyed cartoon lions we're dealing with. 
These were very serious lions who were kept in captivity for a single purpose, which they were extremely effective at executing. Daniel's decision to trust Yahweh in the face of meeting these lions seems almost casual. I promise you, it was not. The way God delivers Daniel seems almost too easy. It was for Yahweh, of course, but the people witnessing this historical event were absolutely amazed and found a new, deep respect for his awesome power. As we read it today, may God fill us with the same. Let's open our hearts, minds, and Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. There's a new king in town. As the writing on the wall predicted, Belshazzar's kingdom in Babylon was divided in two, placing Darius the Mede as the new king over Babylon in partnership with the Persians. Early in his reign, King Darius needed to establish and organize his authority over the city. So that's what's going on in the opening verses of chapter 6. Darius decided to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom stationed throughout the realm and over them three administrators, including Daniel. These satraps would be accountable to them so that the king would not be defrauded. Satraps were rulers over a designated region to collect tribute for the king and ensure order was maintained. In Guinea, where I lived, uh, they're called the chef le quartier, or chief of the neighborhood. I had to get approval from my chef de quartier to move into a neighborhood, uh, renew my residence visa, and then get a Guinean driver's license. These weren't impersonal online forms I filled out, but face-to-face -face meetings where you would recognize each other. If you were causing trouble in your neighborhood and the chef de quartier heard about it, he could take action on behalf of the government with the backing of the military soldiers in the area. In Babylon, in Darius's Babylon, three administrators were in charge of about 40 of these satraps each. And this is how the new ruler spread his authority out quickly so everyone stayed in line and paid their taxes. And how about that? Daniel is one of the three administrators. Pretty interesting that he'd just recently been promoted to third ruler in the kingdom. Coincidence? Hmm. Verse 3. Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps because he had an extraordinary spirit, so the king planned to set him over the whole realm. Can you blame King Darius for having Daniel in mind for this massive promotion? Daniel's resume is off the charts at this point. He does a great job at whatever position of authority he's put in, has a long history of success, isn't loyal to the previous king, has incredible intelligence, integrity, and humility. Intelligence, I like that. A strong spirit, and isn't easily rattled. At this point, Daniel had been serving faithfully in the royal court for nearly 70 years. That's just how long he'd been in the royal court. Unlike the previous young buck, Belshazzar, who seemed to write Daniel off for his age and race, Darius, who is at least 62 at this time, appears to recognize and value the wisdom that comes with people who have been serving God for many years. Word got out that the king was prepping Daniel to be his right-hand man, and that painted a target on Daniel's back. Verses 4 through 5. The administrators and satraps, therefore, kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom, but they could find no charge or corruption, for he was trustworthy, and no negligence or corruption was found in him. Then these men said, We'll never find any charge against Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. So the other two chief administrators and satraps are out for Daniel. Before we paint them out to be heinous bad guys we can't relate to, let's look at, into the context and see if we can't bring it closer to home. Remember, Babylon was just overthrown by a foreign empire, the Medes and Persians. They were sweeping the entire known world. Babylon was their latest trophy, and King Darius was given charge over it. It wasn't a precious city that represented the pride and accomplishments of Mede and Persian culture. 
It was an asset to be managed, a cow to be milked. He needed to control it and start bringing in a profit as soon as possible. Then in a crazy twist, Daniel, a man they liked to remind was from a conquered people, now he was on track to rule over the very people who had conquered him and his people. Being overthrown was bad enough, but there was no way the Babylonians were excited about having a man they brought over as an indentured servant become their authority. What might he do to all those people who treated him like garbage all those years? Perhaps more fresh in mind, don't you imagine Daniel would have recognized the power, powerful people who were desecrating Yahweh's sacred objects at that wild party where the writing on the wall happened? If he wanted to get revenge and make life miserable for the Babylonians, who could blame him? Who could stop him? The possible backlash of Daniel's rise to that level of power was unmistakable. It was even worse when he couldn't be corrupted. They had no angles on him and no way to control him. If you were in Daniel's position, how justified might you feel to take advantage of your position? You know, take a little back from these nasty Babylonians who stole you away from your family and homeland when you were young. Okay, while the standard is getting lower all the time, We all know there are certain things that cannot be in your past if you want to run for public office today, especially if you're running for one of the highest offices of the land. Your past will be gone through with a fine tooth comb. Every parking ticket, uh, every stupid thing you did in school, every relationship that went bad, you better believe if you have any dirt on you at all, it will be made public. That's exactly what was happening to Daniel here. They were going through his entire life looking for something to use against him, some shady deal, some habit, uh, anything they could use to discredit and disqualify him. Eventually, they just quit looking because they couldn't find anything. Whoa, how many of us could bear that kind of scrutiny in our lives? Six through nine. So the administrators and satraps went together to the king and said to him, Making Darius live forever. All the administrators of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, advisors, and governors have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that for 30 days, anyone who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. Therefore, your majesty, Establish the edict and sign the document so that, as a law of the Medes and Persians, it is irrevocable and cannot be changed. So King Darius signed the document. All this show of devotion successfully blinded the king, so he didn't notice that not all the officials came up with the idea. They didn't just give him a world's best boss mug to show their appreciation, but they literally wanted everyone in town to worship him as God of the month. This should sound very familiar from when Nebuchadnezzar set up his statue for the same reason. And King, because we know you're such a busy man with so many important things to do, we've had the edict drafted up for you. Just sign here, making an irrevocable law, and we'll take care of the rest. Oh, they're good. There are lots of ways Daniel could have responded to this edict. He could have just changed up his routine. Uh, He could have prayed more and and just privately and carefully. But that's not what he did in verse 10. When Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. The windows in its upper room opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Again, I'm inspired and amazed by this man's prayer life. He felt the political climate change. He saw the writing on the edict, and he bowed, prayed, and gave thanks. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had done many years before, he placed his trust in the Most High God, which resulted in civil disobedience punishable by painful death. What was so important? Why was he praying in such a specific way? 
There were and are no commands about praying at certain times of day and facing a particular direction. Well, many years before this time, King Solomon spoke at the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. At that point, he prophesied a time when the hearts of Judeans would be hardened and their sins would be so great that they would be forcefully removed from the promised land God had led them into. Here's what Solomon prayed for hundreds of years before Daniel's time, as recorded in 1 Kings 8, 46 through 50. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and hand them over to the enemy, and their captors deport them to the enemy's country, whether distant or nearby, and when they come to their senses in the land where they were deported, and repent, and petition you in their captor's land. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked. And when they return to you with their whole mind and heart in the land of their enemies who took them captive, and when they pray to you in the direction of their land that you have given their ancestors, the city you have chosen, and the temple I have built for your name, may you hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and petition, and uphold their cause. May you forgive your people who sinned against you and all their rebellions against you, and may you give them compassion in the eyes of their captors so that they may be compassionate to them. This prayer practice of Daniel, it, it wasn't superstition. He was intentionally following the scenario described in Solomon's prayer. In line with this request, Daniel faced Jerusalem three times a day, pleading mercy for his people and for himself from the King of Kings. As such, he wouldn't have been hard to find. Verses 11 through 14. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. So they approached the king and asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days any man who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, As the law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and is irrevocable. Then they replied to the king, Daniel, one of the Judean exiles has ignored you, the king, and the edict you signed, for he prays three times a day as soon as the king heard this. He was very displeased. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. The king truly messed this one up. He didn't see this coming, and he knew he was stuck. He didn't see how he could possibly save his right-hand man without breaking his word, which had gone out irrevocable as a bullet from a barrel. 15 to 18. Then these men went to the king and said to him, You as king know it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and he could not sleep. Oh, Darius wasn't hungry and he didn't want to watch a show. All he could think about was how he got duped by his highest officials and sent his most trusted and revered advisor to a gruesome death. That lion's den was a cave, cage, and a tomb all in one. They kept those big cats hungry for a reason. I imagine whatever expression Daniel had on his face when he was thrown into the den must have been etched on King Darius's mind and haunted him through the night. But Daniel was different. His God was different. Darius heard Daniel tell story after story of having been miraculously saved by his God when there was absolutely no hope. 
over and over, Daniel declared things that were impossible for him to know on his own, and he was always very quick to clarify that it was his God who told him these things. Lots of wise men claimed to hear from their God, but Daniel was never wrong, and there was no way to fake what he revealed. Everyone claimed their God was powerful, but Daniel's God proved himself powerful in front of everyone on numerous occasions. And yet, wasn't this the same God who allowed Daniel to be conquered and taken away in the first place? Wasn't this the same God whose temple vessels were being desecrated the day Darius came and overthrew the city? Darius still had those things on display in the palace. Why didn't this God save his people all the time? Why would he sometimes allow his people to suffer and his own name be used as a mockery? No denying this God was real, but there was just no predicting or controlling what this God would do. It kept him up all night, but in verses 19 through 22. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel, Daniel, servant to the living God, the king said. Has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths. They haven't hurt me, for I was found innocent before him. Also, I have not committed a crime against you, my king. Daniel was putting the truth of his name on display, since Daniel means, my God is the judge. God's assessment of Daniel was the only one that mattered, and he was found innocent of all charges. 23. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den, uninjured, for he trusted in his God. There are various games around the world where players are permitted to lie about what they have or don't have in order to win. Other players are allowed to call out and accuse the person of lying, and if they are indeed lying, the liar takes the penalty. But if you accuse them and they are not lying, the person doing the accusing takes the penalty. In Persian society, it was common practice, the same thing in their justice systems. It was designed to make people think long and hard before they accuse someone of something they didn't do. As a side note for parents and those in management positions, it's not the worst strategy in the world if you're in a situation where people are stretching the truth in order to get others in trouble. This part of Persian law came swiftly into practice in verse 24. The king then gave the command, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den, they, their children, and their wives. They had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. This reminds us of the fiery furnace, where the ones who were thrown in to be killed were totally unharmed, having been protected by Heavenly Presence, who was with them through the trial, while the ones throwing them in were destroyed. This account also viciously snaps us out of any notions that these lions maybe weren't so dangerous in the first place. To the contrary, these particular lions were probably quite a bit more dangerous than one you'd meet in the wild. A wild lion might size you up from a distance and leave you alone. These lions, however, had absolutely no confusion on what to do with humans when one entered their domain. For these lions not to attack, as they always did, speaks to the power of Yahweh. These thoughtless beasts fully understood who it is who reigns everywhere at all times, who gives and takes away strength and authority. At the command of Yahweh, the mighty Lion of Judah, these creatures shut their mouths. Okay, this is a harsh punishment by today's standards, but in those days there was a strong sense not only of personal responsibility, but of guilt that would affect an entire family or an entire people when the leader was guilty. In this way, Darius was ridding his kingdom of guilt and preventing future generations from seeking out revenge for this punishment. 25 to 28. 
Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live in all the earth, May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is a living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, for he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Chapter 6 ends very similarly to the public declarations of the king in chapters 2 and 3. In all three accounts, the resulting edict is well-intentioned, but we all know you can't write a law to govern people's hearts. Laws and rules can help govern our actions, to be sure, but we're incapable of governing even our own hearts. What's more, the hearts of others. That kind of change requires the ongoing supernatural work of God. The similarities don't stop there. These three accounts remind us of another godly man who lived under the violent rule of a conquering king. Someone who lived as a servant among his people, yet his heart was unquestionably loyal to the city of God. Someone who operated with total righteousness. Someone so above corruption that those who rejected his authority and wanted him dead had to resort to using his obedience as a trap. He did not come to seize political power nor demonstrate acts of civil disobedience, but did not avoid them when his obedience to God became punishable by death. Like Daniel, he was put in a cave for dead men, and a stone was rolled over the entrance to seal him in. And like Daniel, he was delivered, declared innocent by God, and having destroyed the plans of his enemies, emerged miraculously and victoriously, resulting in praise being given to God and glory and power being restored to him beyond what he had before because of his obedience. Isn't he wonderful? Our King Jesus does not promise to take us around trouble, but he does promise to always be with us in the worst of it. Even he does not create edicts to command the hearts of his people, but offers something much, much better in Ezekiel eleven nineteen through 20. And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit with them, within them. I will remove their heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh so they may follow my statutes keep my ordinances, and practice them. Then they will be my people, and I will be their God. Amen, amen, and amen to that. Yes, that's what we need. We don't need another command telling us to fear and respect God. My mind already agrees with that. What we need are new hearts that adore Him and want to obey Him. What I got this week was the same thing I've been getting since we cracked this book open weeks ago. We are to be humble people of prayer and obedient to God, come what may. I'm watching our church grow in prayer. I'm watching my wife, my kids, and myself grow. I sense God's pleasure in that, even though Daniel shows me I still have a very long way to go. I found myself a little envious of the lions in Daniel chapter 6. How come they seem to get it better than I do? Why don't I just close my mouth and obey when the Lord has spoken? Lord, please continue to do good work in us. Do whatever you need to do. And Daniel, what would it be like to be the kind of person where my enemies knew that I would rather die than stop praying? Would my family and friends think that way about me, much less my enemies? Is our commitment to prayer this obvious to those around us? Lord, please continue. Do your good work in us. Do whatever you need to do. Seeing Daniel's response to Solomon's prayer request from hundreds of years earlier gives me confidence about fasting and praying in response to a 157-year-old proclamation by President Lincoln. Thank you, Lord, for confirming that. How Daniel prayed when his death was made imminent blows me away. 
how much of my prayer time is spent asking God to change things in comparison to being grateful for the massive generosity He's already shown me. The more clearly we see who God is and the great things He's already done for us, the more consistently our hearts will be moved to praise and thank Him, regardless of circumstances. What is more, when we start with gratitude, we tune our hearts to remember God's past faithfulness to us, which makes us better able to trust His wisdom and power to answer our petitions for the future. This pattern of praying at regular intervals throughout the day is traditionally called daily office. There are plenty of books that contain readings of psalms and other scriptures intended for different times of the day. For the more techie, there are plenty of apps and plans in the YouVersion Bible, such as the Book of Common Prayer. Those same readings can also be easily generated for you by visiting dailyoffice.app. If you've got something else that helps you in your prayer life, please, please share that with the rest of us on Faith Life so we can help each other grow in this together. And now let me speak a blessing over you from 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 12 and 13. And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone. May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.